on your Jump, 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 jump. What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party how you doing, ladies and gentlemen? It's Talib Kweli, the BKMC, the MCEO. Welcome to another wonderful, fantastic edition of the People's Party. I got over there dancing for some reason. My wonderful, beautiful, lovely co-host Jasmine Lee. Give it up. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> now, Jasmine, uh, you've been living in Los Angeles for a long time now. Six years, baby. Do you ever eat at food trucks? How can I live in L.A. and not eat at a food truck? See, 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 that's what I'm talking about. Today's guest, you're going to love today's guest. Because today's guest started one of the most famous food trucks in the country. Uh, he's responsible for multiple culinary revolutions here in America. He's a chef. He's an author. He's a filmmaker. He's a traveler. He's a big thinker. He made the Time 100 Most Influential People list twice. Two times. People's Party, give it up for Roy Choi. Yeah, baby. Not to be Roy Choi. Choi. Thanks for the intro. Beautiful. Hi. What's up, Roy Choi? What's up, Dex? Is that a fish smoking a cigar? It is. I think oh, it's wow. a blunt. Yeah, it's my it's a fish full. smoking a blunt. My friends, uh, yeah, this is his new company, Real Bad Man. Oh, wow. Okay. We need some product placement. Oh, uh, no. Can just... we get some shirts? I would oh, love yeah, a yeah. fish smoking a cigar. <laughs> yeah. Right a on my boobs. A blunt. Yeah, right on there. Um, so I want to start off. By apologizing to you. Okay. And also uh, apologizing to your whole crew, Adam and everybody, the softball crew. Oh, yeah. Why? Because I went a little too hard when we was playing that softball game. <laughs> oh, we got, we got that on uh, Adam's Instagram. So um, Adam Vitz from the Beastie Boys yeah. has a softball situation every oh. Sunday. What? Right? Here? Here in L.A. Yeah, oh, you, it started in New York. It's on the east side. Yeah, they have a New York. I, I, we want to get to the point where L.A. can play New York. Okay, that okay. Wow. I didn't realize it's two different situations. Yeah, I think it's his friends in New York, okay. and then it's his friends here in L.A. I played with him in New York mm -hmm. on the concrete. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you like, guys play on concrete? Oh, we play on concrete. concrete. We played across the street from Hot 97. I used to play Little League. Okay. And that competitive, uh, competitive spirit has not come out of me yeah. and uh, sports in quite some time. Yeah. So when I was round in third, I took you, the catcher out. That's what I did. Oh my god! <laughs> I was round in third, and it was I came like a little. Pete Rose. It was, I came a little too hard at the catcher. It was football. I got on my on my Pete Rose. <laughs> I was gambling on the game. Everything. I was. I was just straight Pete Rose. Yeah. So tell Adam I said, my bad. Okay. I think we all cheered it. I think it was the highlight of the whole season. To man. be honest. Yeah, man, that league is amazing. It, it is. It, it's just. It's, it's one a of those, great situation. It's one of those things where. It just, with all the things going on in life, um, just makes you smile and be out yeah. there. No matter how bad you do or whatever, it's just, and just the people that, that he brings together, mm -hmm. you know, yourself. and mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I met you there. Yeah, there'll be always someone there, um, someone that you either listen to or been a part, that's been a part of pop culture or whatever for mm -hmm. a long period of time. But then there's also just a whole group of us that just like really connect on. And on, anyone on. can play. Like sometimes anyone. it just be random people in the park joining. Oh, I'm yeah, coming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be the random. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you can show up anytime. It's on the east side. Anytime. Yeah, yeah anytime. baby. It's dope. Um, You have a strong connection with hip hop. Yeah, I've been, I've been around it for a long time. A lot yeah. of chefs do. Um, yeah. Rappers love food lyrics, right? Yeah. MF Doom had a whole food album, Mmm Food. Yeah. Um, Eminem was throwing up his mom's spaghetti. Yep. Which I always think is a funny lyric because he's so tough in Eight Mile, but also his mom's makes spaghetti for him. Mm. Um, Dead Prez, uh, you know, they they do they deal with all types of food justice and they have like yeah. songs about eating healthy. Um, you know, um, Eat to Live. I did a song about that mm -hmm. with Mad Lib. What's your favorite food related rap lyric? Oh, man. I just did, uh, I'm horrible at remembering exact stuff, but all the stuff you just mentioned for sure. But I think the Beastie Boys talked about food so much in, yeah. in a funny way for sure, yeah. just to keep going on at them a little bit. And I had the opportunity, I think we both did the book together, the mm -hmm. podcast. Their, yeah, their I, did, book, I did some yeah. voiceover. We did like a little zine mm -hmm. inside. So what we did was we took their lyrics from their songs and made recipes out of them. Oh, mm. wow. So I think like for me... Cookie Puss was the first Beastie Boys yeah, track. Yeah, Cookie Puss was the first <laughs> track. Food. That was their demo, right? <laughs> their first track. Um, but I think for them, um, I, I think it, it's really with them that uh, mm -hmm. for me, the food really stood out as far as them just having fun with it, playing with it mixing it into the rhymes not really looking at it from from a deep reason or anything like that but really just using the the food as wordplay but also 
stuff that they were eating at that time. Mine was 50 Cent. I love you like a fat kid loves cake. Oh. <laughs> I use it all the is, time. Yeah, classic. So speaking of music and chefs, mm -hmm. so I'm actually a chef too. I went oh, to really? culinary school and everything. You keep saying this. I know, and you still haven't come over for oh, any yeah, You food. were talking about going on Chopped earlier, right? Yes, you told me to go on Chopped Juniors, and yeah. I am because I'm 14. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was I wasn't saying because you're age. I'm saying because you could beat you could beat all these little kids. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, okay, so I was wondering, because I know I used to be a, um, a prep cook. That was, like, my first job. Okay. And so I always had my uh, hip-hop playlist, things that would really get me in a mood to mm -hmm. chop up some vegetables. Yeah. So what is your playlist when you're prep cooking? It depends. I mean, um, as you know, in the kitchens, everyone, just like family meal, everyone has to cook family meal on a different day. And mm -hmm. then in the kitchen, everyone gets, gets control of the music every different day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the great thing about hip-hop and all kinds of music in the kitchen is like we're in there for like three, four to six hours prepping. And so we have the ability to just listen to albums all the way through. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was always like a lot of West Coast stuff, you know, everything from Snoop to Dilated Peoples and um, and Freestyle Fellowship, J5, mm -hmm. all that stuff. We just let that stuff play. And then um, a lot of older East Coast stuff for sure. Quality was an album that I played a lot in one of my first kitchens. Oh wow! For sure, yeah. When I okay. first became a chef that ran kitchens, we were playing a lot of a lot of Black Star, a mm -hmm. lot a lot of quality. Um, we we're playing uh, a lot of the Roots, and um, you know, and then we go a lot a, a lot of De La's played in kitchens. Mm. Oh man, yeah, De La Tribe, you know. Whew. So that's family. I think, uh, yeah, that's family. I know Jerobi and, and yeah. Shout Ali, out to yeah. Jerobi. Just got married. Yeah, shout out to Jerobi. Yeah, congratulations for sure. Mm -hmm. Um. But I would say Tribes played a lot in the kitchen, for sure. Dead right. Prez. Uh, and Jerobi's like, you know, chef community. Yeah. Yeah, because he left Tribe to go to culinary school. To go to culinary school and yeah, cook. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, his food's good. It's yeah, really it is. Good. We did a pop-up together, and uh food was so tasty. He was doing a, a pop-up, uh, not a pop-up, but he was doing a Taco Tuesday residency in New York for a couple of years. Yeah, Taco I think he's doing Tuesday. it in Miami now. Is he? Yeah. Okay. Your truck, mm -hmm. Koji, yeah. changed the game. Not just for food trucks, not just for yeah. cuisine, but for you. Um, I've heard you describe it or the energy creating mm -hmm. it to like early Wu Tang demos. Yeah, I mean we we were we were a force, and uh, it was all by accident, mm -hmm. you know. And it was all by accident. It was all by the circumstances of life at that moment. Sounds like a beautiful mistake. Yeah, it yeah. really was. It was two thousand eight. Um, I was a grown ass man by then. I had a career <laughs> and I lost everything, mm -hmm. you know, and when you lose, when you lose stuff or you get fired or life goes a different direction when you're young, it's like, fuck it. Who mm -hmm. cares? Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you pick up and you go different ways. But when you got a family and you're a grown man and you lose everything and uh, the economy at the same time, you lose everything. The economy crashes around you. Mm -hmm. uh, you wake up to realize that the banking system has lied to you and pulled the rug from under you. Mm -hmm. And uh, people are getting kicked out of their homes, losing their jobs, and there's nothing out there. The whole industry is uh, hiring. You're overqualified for everything because everything is being, all the budgets are being cut down. Mm -hmm. And so I spent like three months looking for a job after I got laid off. And Where'd you get laid off from? I got laid off from a restaurant in Sanctuary City called mm -hmm. Rock Sugar. Okay. But I deserved oh. that shit. I okay. really did. Uh, Why? As, as I look back now in hindsight, <laughs> I feel like it was a spiritual calling. Okay. To, to I was boost. never I was never um, an entrepreneur or or an artist before. Mm -hmm. I had as a kid and growing up, I had these creative visions, but mm -hmm. I could never mm -hmm. express them. I didn't have the. I wasn't lucky enough, like a lot of, like yourself and a mm -hmm. lot of other friends that I have that w were able to find creative outlets very early mm -hmm. and. Um, and being Asian, a lot of that stuff was suppressed as well. So mm -hmm. I had to deal with it on a double level where, mm -hmm. one, I couldn't find my nat my form in the in the five elements of hip hop. You know, I, couldn't, right. I wasn't a great dancer. I wasn't great on the mic, anything like that. I wasn't great at drawing. But I was seeing the world in this weird way, but I couldn't tell anyone or, or show anyone. Mm -hmm. So then my parents were like, show us. Well, if you can't show us, then you're going to have to go study. Right, <laughs> you know, right, right. You know that, that's just bullshit. And so I dealt with all of that going on and um so in any case i ended up just being a, um, a chef i worked for mm. a company and you know th those were my dreams just to move up i moved up the hilton uh corporation um mm -hmm. i started running 
I went from a property chef to becoming the chef at the Beverly Hilton. Yeah, that's a yeah. storied hotel. Yeah, that's the Hollywood Hotel, you yeah. know. They have award ceremonies. It's been that's around the since Golden the 50s. Globes. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, I became a corporate chef, and then I moved on and opened this huge restaurant called Rock Sugar in Century City. But when, when I opened Rock Sugar, what happened was in during R&D, everything was going fine. I was getting along with everyone. And then the moment we opened the restaurant, this was a huge restaurant. This was... Just to give a little context in the food world, mm -hmm. um, the food world has been always kind of like a power structure situation where uh, it was almost like labels ran everything. Mm -hmm. So it was just if you wanted to eat good, you had to go to the fancy restaurants and everything else was kind of mom and pop or mm -hmm. in between. There weren't any food blogs at that time. There wasn't information that you could get where young chefs could start a five seat five table restaurant in Brooklyn and, mm -hmm. and source ingredients and charge 30 bucks and mm -hmm. whatever. And so I was working for these, this big restaurant and um, man, like I just, uh, this restaurant was a, Oh, what I was going to say was this restaurant was a huge opening, like literally like 1500 covers a night. Mm -hmm. um, celebrities coming in all over. We're doing like prep um, just in like shorthand terms. We were doing like Lexans. Lexans are huge. Mm -hmm containers the size of this table we're doing lexans of prep like 10 of them of mm -hmm. each thing um burning through everything the whole night and then having to start over the next day um in most cases i would have been able to orchestrate and organize all of those things and you have a team of like 30 people that are relying on you mm -hmm. i became a deer in headlights like everything almost like i had amnesia i woke up and i couldn't remember almost everything that i was very proficient at like if you were to wake up and not know how to rhyme it was <coughs> that's my worst nightmare change. yeah it happened to me yeah well like i it's literally crazy. everything that came as fluid as water to me i completely had amnesia and my team was like i could hear it i could then i could start hear the rumblings in the background like my team was like yo what's up with chef roy man you know mm -hmm. like what's going on we need them and then 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 it started escalating to the point where people were kind of like i could see their hands coming in and taking over from me oh, and all no. these things and then one day I walked in, uh, they called me in and uh, there was a manila envelope on the table and I knew, you know, mm -hmm. and there was a bunch of the corporate team there and I just knew, but it, it, it never, I never had been fired like that before. I got fired when I was like younger in high school and stuff, but mm -hmm. um, I never, I was like, a, I, I was like the star student for the last 15 years. Yeah. You, had, you the, were fully invested in Fully this. invested in yeah. this career and this craft and this, in everything. And it hit me hard. And so um, a lot of depression, couldn't find a job. And then my friend called me and we started selling tacos on the street. It was literally mm -hmm. to just survive. Now, you describe this mm -hmm. in the same way that an independent artist would describe their career. In mm -hmm. fact, a lot of the terms you use, you talk about having this block like a writer's block. You talk yeah. about it being run like labels versus a mom and pop. Yeah, I've, I've read that you consider Koji a band and A-Frame your first solo album. Yeah. Right? So... Can you, what, what's your other properties? Do you, do you feel that same way? I do. Um, I, I, the latest restaurant I opened to continue on that tip is uh, Best Friend in Las Vegas. And I consider that my, my compilation album of everything. Mm. Um, not the greatest hits, but everything that the last 11 years has kind of opened the door for me on. Um, and it's a little bit of a tribute album of, of everything from Kogi to Chego a frame mm. to commissary pot, all these things, and the city of Los Angeles and the culture of Los Angeles and the culture of especially uh, brown and black and Asian kids in Los Angeles. Mm. And it was like I had this vision of let's go to this place in Las Vegas where a lot of times culture is is void or, or gets lost in the vacuum, and let's bring kind of the deepest, most personal things to that environment. I feel like people are going to love it and, and they're going to get it. And so, yeah, it, I treat everything that way. And Kogi is like a band because um, we all came from different backgrounds and we all came from, we all added different things to to the recipe, you know? Okay, I just realized I've been pronouncing it wrong. It's, uh, it's Kogi. Oh, Kogi. Kogi with a hard G, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm But it's okay, Kogi. it could go either way. Okay. It's so funny how yeah. like... Um, <clears throat> how chefs fit into that same rebel personality that like hip hop artists do or like rock stars oh, yeah. do. And like, if you're not going the corporate route and you're going on a food truck, it's like you are independent and you're just freestyling in the same way yeah. someone would just pick up the mic and start freestyling. And it's just like mm -hmm. all the coaches just merge together. Yeah. The weird thing, you're, I mean, what you're 
hitting on is um, a lot of times that people end up in the kitchens because we can't fit in anywhere else, mm -hmm. you know. And, and the kitchen, I think, to me, it's a it's a great model or microcosm to to kind of like I think it could cure a lot of the problems that we have in this country in this world because we don't discriminate or judge in mm -hmm. the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter your race, where you came from, even if you just walked out of the, walked out of the jail to come in, if you came off off the streets it don't matter they'll take you all it matters is if you count, knock on our door mm -hmm. and you're willing to work get an apron on and let's go now you said you were at a very low point when you started yeah. uh kogi yeah can you walk us through starting a food truck business for someone who feels like they might have the skills mm -hmm. but they don't maybe have the capital or the resources because it sounds like you were you know we're just scra scrapping by it when you started yeah well i think there are a few points um one is you got to pay homage to the the culture and the history of it. Mm -hmm. um, what happened after Kogi, there was a huge gold rush and a huge boom of a lot of folks, especially in Portland, Austin, uh, Seattle, and um, one other city on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. I, I, but in any case, there was this huge boom of people literally walking out of their offices and their cubicles yeah. and starting their old macaroni and cheese recipe. Um, but a lot... Uh, I was always like torn between it because for us, there was a whole life and generation before this modern food truck movement. And that's the, the culture of the Latino taqueros, especially and, here, and loncheras, especially in Los Angeles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important one to respect your elders and, and the generation before you and really pay homage to, to the work that they did for the streets. Yeah. Um, there's that. And then the other thing is you got to remember that the first bite is the most important thing mm -hmm. in the world, you know, and to break it down a little bit, a restaurant, you have a lot of opportunities to make a mistake and mm -hmm. still come out on top. And what I mean by that is you have the host or host or hostess or whoever greeting someone. You have the you have the water being dropped. You have the waiter approaching. You have the bread basket. You have the music. You have the ambience. You have all these things that if you somehow make a little mistake or the food's two, three minutes late, or mm. maybe you missed a touch of seasoning, you can make it up on dessert. You know? Right. Or drink. But in a food truck, if that first bite ain't hitting. That's all you got. That's all you got. You're right. When I go to yeah. a restaurant, I've, you know. It's like a battle rap. Or, yeah. Yeah. Know? Like when I'm at a <laughs> restaurant a that's supposed to be fancy, it's supposed uh -huh. to be good food. Uh, you know, you make a, a judgment in your head. You're like, oh, you know, I like the shrimp, but I didn't like the noodles. And, you know, yeah. but if you like the shrimp, you're like, I might come back for the shrimp mm -hmm. if the vibe is right and mm -hmm. this and that. But you're right. With a food truck, it's it's immediate. One so, hit or quitter. That's it. So there's that. And the other thing is you got to. I believe. It doesn't mean you have to come from the streets. Um, but you got to you got to love the streets. Mm -hmm. It's street food. Yeah. You know, so and you've owned that. Yeah. And you can't it can't just be. A, some sort of business venture um, or some sort of scalable model that you're going to exploit. Um, they are still the streets and you got to, you got to love it and you got to love it for more than just one aspect of it. And it, it you know, you got to love everything about it. The, the smells, the sounds, the mothers, the kids, the gangsters, the, the workers, everyone, you know, mm. the population, the people, the community. Yeah. And um, if you don't love the streets in many cases, I don't see how your street food is going to evolve or or be a success. And I've seen that happen over the last 10 years. Yeah, where people can taste the difference, too. They can taste the difference. So yeah. that would be my advice is maybe take a look in the mirror and do you love hanging out on the streets? I mean, I love that shit. Like The things that I loved as a kid that were told to me that were worthless, like these are the things I used to do, Holly, just as a kid. I was never, again, I told you I was never talented. So, right. But I was always around everyone. I was always around ciphers and, and skaters mm -hmm. and... I was always there. I was. So you understood much, the creative I, flow of energy. Yeah, I was always part of crews, but I was always usually the one smoking weed. You know, like, <laughs> right. you know? but what I loved to do was literally just hang out in parking lots, share shit with my friends, watch the street, uh, the sun go down, the street lamps go up. And I never wanted to leave the parking lot. I never mm -hmm. wanted to leave the alley. You know, it's very important. That's because yeah. I, I feel like that's really what the story is. It's like when, yeah. you, when you learn about McDonald's. You mm -hmm. learn that they're not in the business of hamburgers. They're in the business of real estate. It's about location. Yeah. I feel like for you, that's what you're in the business of, that mm -hmm. that experience. It is. And those things that not only, I guess, my my family, but also society told me were worthless, that couldn't be anything, that mm -hmm. those things are 
you know, those, those things aren't what are going to make you successful. Mm -hmm. Those are the cornerstones of Koki. That's our philosophy. Hanging out in the parking lot, watching the sun go down, watching the street lamps go up, sharing with each other, uh, talking to each other, um, going out of your way to be considerate and kind to each other, mm -hmm. and um, but still represent the streets. So I think my advice would be if, if you're at the point where everything's lining up, two things. Give the food to your friends or people, and if the first bite doesn't doesn't make those people say "fuck," this shit is fucking crazy. Right. If it right. doesn't make people say that, it's like the equivalent of, of rap punchlines. It literally lines. is battle punch rap. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. it's literally Ooh. battle rap. Ah, yeah. And then and then it's like so funny because like when you have a food truck, it's like you don't you can't have any distractions. When you have um when you have a hip hop show, you can have dancers, mm -hmm. you can have light effects, you can have them pushing you up in the air. But when you're in the middle of a battle rap, mm -hmm. it's like, what are your rhymes? I don't care. And, and with the food truck, it's like, what does your food taste like? Because you don't have any music, mm -hmm. you don't have any servers, you don't have any drinks. Feed me so, um, satisfied. Right. And if you do it right, 1,500 people going to line up in the street. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because word of mouth is, is, yeah. is the truth. Yeah. We, you never saw that. You, you were never in a Kogi line in 09. No. Or, I wasn't. I, I remember yeah. hearing about it, but I wasn't part of the phenomenon. It was crazy, man. Was, I can only imagine it was like Washington Square Park, mm -hmm. you know, in the early days, or or anything, any movement. You right. Know, it was. It was. A, it was a love movement for sure. That's interesting that you compared it to Washington uh -huh. Square Park. Um, somebody just brought up to me that uh, they were watching Netflix, the Hip Hop Evolution thing. Yeah. And, I, and it, when watching myself in that park, oh, you're on that. <laughs> it reminded me. I was like, I didn't have a deal then. Yeah. The, the time they did talking about how myself and Gene Gray and Supernatural mm -hmm. and Yasin Bey and all these people yeah. that we held this influence in the hip hop space without being in the industry. Yeah. You know? And that's um, how Kogi was the first yeah. two years. I mean, we're still independent, but the first two years was like that. We yeah. were just doing it for the love, literally buying the food the night before, prepping it the morning of, completely being sold out. And, and having a conversation and a relationship with our, our audience and our crowd. Because mm -hmm. um, we created some really, like, uh, we created some really crazy, like, I guess, touchstones of what I consider our culture. Mm -hmm. um, because these lines were 1,500 people long. We're one little truck. And um, the lines, they took like three, four hours. Mm -hmm. And we only had, you know, there's only a finite amount of food that this truck can hold. And there's this amount of people. And so we used to go out. I, I used to go out and go on, on top of the truck and or walk the line. And this is where I started to develop, I guess, my my confidence and my personality. Is this when you became Poppy? This is when I became Poppy. Okay. Yeah, where I became pop, yeah, Poppy of the Streets. They, yeah. You know, it, it wasn't from a sexual standpoint. It was, it, it was from <laughs> like a fatherly, <laughs> fatherly standpoint. Because yeah, I, yeah. I really went to these stops and talked to everyone and said, listen, you know. And I made agreements with everyone. Like, listen. You see our truck, you see this line, and you know we only have this amount of food. So I know you want to order 10 burritos, you know, and I know you want to have five quesadillas and 12 tacos, but that means that only half of us will eat. So if all of us eat, that means here are the limits. So you've and been talking communion the whole yeah. time. Like yeah. you've been talking about being together with people, mm -hmm. getting sitting at a table or sitting somewhere mm -hmm. eating, breaking bread and and, yeah. and, 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 and feeding each other. Mm -hmm. Right. But also when you get to the point of success, it's not about capitalism of like how many more dollars I can make, no. but it's about how are we going to feed everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's far more interesting than making money. It is. That's yeah. that's life. You know, um, money is this thing that has possessed us. It's a piece of paper that I mean, it's important. It, it creates motivation, but it shouldn't be. the. I, I guess for me, because I'm a chef, I look at things in in the realm of a recipe, mm -hmm. you know, and money is just one ingredient in a recipe of life. Absolutely. But for That's some a reason, way to look at it. yeah, for some reason we've made it the only thing, you know, that, mm -hmm. that means or matters to, right. to, we to judge something. people who are not yeah. chasing it. Yeah. And you should not because if you stop chasing money, it's going to come. Everyone has to eat regardless. Yeah. There's a, that's a big problem. I don't know if we're going to get into that topic, but, um, there's we so many get into people, whatever you want to get. There's into. so many people that, that, <laughs> need food and need nourishment and um, are eating the wrong things. And the thing, the, the, the illusion that a lot of people don't understand is that there is not, there's plenty of food to feed people in this world. Absolutely. There's too much food. Right. We throw it out. We throw it out, but it's just the distribution of it and, and the, the division of it that doesn't allow us to see ourselves as humans, that this basic fundamental right 
again, going back to the money is something that, that we restrict ourselves from allowing to share with people because mm -hmm. in some way it feels as if, if we allow everyone to eat well, that somehow you, you who are maybe in a position that is a little more fortunate, mm -hmm. lose something. And um, this whole kind of binary idea point of if you, if, if everyone gets something, that means you lose something. And, yeah. and, and that, that it's is, not a pie. It's not a pie. To make another know? food reference. Yeah. So is that why you decided to start local? I don't know if it was one specific point that drove me to starting local. Um, it, it was it was a partnership with a with a really amazing chef named Daniel Patterson and Oh, it's my cousin. <laughs> is that your cousin? No, okay. it's just my last name. Sorry. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> could be. It could be. Um, I have a relationship with the community of Watts, uh, mm -hmm. specifically the Jordan Downs. A housing community very famous 103rd grape community. street yeah. yeah anzac um that's my family very and symbolic of of los angeles hoods yeah yeah i mean the grape street is yeah. the biggest you yeah. know and so weirdly i've I, i've i'm not a gang member but mm -hmm. i've been i've been accepted into the community you mm -hmm. know and um i don't know i come from an era where it was more about being a part of a crew than it was about your race, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, so yeah. Um, I think people, it's just followed me my whole life. Like I can hang with anybody, right. you know? And so um, I went on tour with Styles P uh -huh. who has, uh, he, he's, he's like the healthy gangster yeah. at this point. Well, and he, he started that juice thing, right? Yeah. He opened yeah. up some juice bars, uh -huh. but he's been very instrumental in teaching uh, people in hip hop about food deserts. Yeah. Can you break that? Because, uh, essentially, Watts, where you opened up, was a food desert, right? It is. Can you break down what a food desert is? Well, I mean, a food desert is where there are no grocery stores, mm -hmm. fresh produce, or healthy food items um, that are accessible within a certain mile radius, and especially at affordable price points. Mm -hmm. But if you really break it down even further, it's if you take all of the things that we take for granted, even this cup of coffee right here, right? Mm -hmm. Even, um, Even this beautiful clear glass of water right here mm -hmm. you know those are food deserts because mm -hmm. the water is not clear there is no starbucks there is no coffee shop there's no wi-fi there's no place for someone who has an idea to plug into a wi-fi to be able to maybe explore and spend some time in their mind and explore uh that creative journey in that process mm -hmm. um and then the also the food is, is 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 just terrible we had van lathan on who yeah. uh went from being obese mm -hmm. to just working out but he talks about his diet and how he was programmed as yeah. a kid to eat certain very bad things yeah and especially here on the west coast at least on the east coast you, you all have food deserts too but you have mm -hmm. a lot of Caribbean communities mm -hmm. that, yeah. that you know within within the neighborhoods that yeah. that that don't come from America. So right. even I without money, cooking. yeah, even without money, you're still cooking with fruits and vegetables yeah. and rice and you know. When I was a teenager, I was food. I would I would mostly eat at Caribbean mm -hmm. restaurants. When yeah. I started learning about food, mm -hmm. every corner, yeah. uh, every corner. it's crazy because I mean, food. That's another that's another way to control and to keep people yeah. poor because it's like if you're not giving them access to fresh mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables then they're going to eat what's around exactly. them and so what they're going to get obese or they're going to die early or and they're going to keep teaching their kids yeah. like this is what you're supposed to eat so that's why something like local is so important yeah so i you know i don't know if it is i'm, I'm not smart enough to know if it is a conspiracy or who's oh, it controlling is. it you know obviously i I believe that it is, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, <laughs> right. but the thing the evidence is, certainly points the evidence in that direction. definitely points yeah. in that direction. And it's not even a conspiracy because it's right there in our faces. Right, we right know. There in our faces. <laughs> if you do the research, yeah. if you look, you can see the information, but, yeah. but please, yeah, continue. No, but the food is, it, it is corrosive, processed, preservative based, chemical lab food, right? Mm -hmm. And so that food in combination with tobacco and alcohol are the three components that really infiltrate a lot of our communities that become what is defined as a food desert. So oh, yeah. if you can't get fresh produce, if you are being infiltrated by preservatives and processed food, um, and the only thing that you're able to eat or access mm -hmm. or afford are foods that are filled with sodiums and sugars, um, what that is is basically someone has set off a ticking time bomb within your body, mm -hmm. you know, and you may be fine as a young 18 year old, you know, and even going into your twenties and thirties, but by the time you become to your mid thirties to your forties, 
that stuff will start to explode within you mm. because there are no nutrients in that. And our body, I think, um, can, can accept a certain amount of that for a certain period of time. Right. Just like you can drive a car with no oil for a certain amount of mm -hmm. time. But at some point, gonna that stuff is going to break. Yeah. And, and, and it seems as though our body at about 40 um, breaks down. Because if you look at, again, the facts within um, the communities and the inner cities, a lot of people are dying around 40 to 50. Absolutely. I'm, I'm 40 plus now and yeah. I feel the changes in my own body. Yeah. And I've been very blessed and privileged yeah. to live a lifestyle that allows me mm -hmm. to tailor my diet in a way that most people are not. And yeah. I've, I was raised by educator parents, so mm -hmm. I, I learned things early on. Yeah. But a lot of people, I mean, obviously what you're talking about, it disproportionately affects poor people. Mm -hmm. And obviously yeah. in countries that are run by white supremacists, it disproportionately, the poor people are mostly people of color, right? Of course. So you started a TV show mm -hmm. to combat this broken yeah. bread on KCET. Yeah, it's on public television. Mm -hmm. And then also... Uh, a platform like uh, Uproxx called Tastemade mm -hmm. uh, on the internet. Um, and so it was a combination of them two and, and myself coming together to try to tell these stories um, of the marginalized, you mm -hmm. know, of and our, not only the marginalized, but also us, all of us in our world. So we approached things like food access, food justice, food waste, um, did a whole episode on Watts and local. Um, so, yeah, I mean... I, I, I just the way I, the way we looked at local and the way I look at broken bread is that I guess from being a chef for us we look at the world very simply mm -hmm. right if something is rotten it's rotten if something is not cut correctly or if the prep is not correct or if you didn't rotate it's just not right mm -hmm. it's okay it's not a personal attack right but you know what Kali today you didn't do the tomatoes right Right. Okay, so I'm gonna pull you over. We're gonna look at this. We're gonna fix it, and we're gonna we're gonna make the correction. It, it has nothing to do with anyone's political stance or any power struggle. It, it has to do with just the truth, right. and um, and so we tried to look at, at at these situations where, and ask these questions. How can we allow whatever we feel politically, or how people in power feel about people in, of color? How can we just look at our world and say that? people aren't allowed to eat, you know, and mm -hmm. people aren't allowed to drink clean water or, um, or all of that stuff exists, but the gatekeepers of that aren't, are deliberately holding it back and then infiltrating it with toxic right. ingredients. And so, um, yeah, we, with both of these projects is looking at that. And instead of leading with antagonistic points of view, we just try to lead with love, you know, and that's, that's also the perks of social media these days too, yeah. because you un like, now more than ever, you have people people of color or whatever that are showing, oh, clean eating, work hard, clean eat or whatever, mm -hmm. and they're 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 talking about alkaline foods and things of that nature. So like they're giving you access mm -hmm. to see what else is out there besides just right in front of you. And there's still the reality too of like, because you know I relate to everyone. I relate to to teenagers, youngsters, all the way to to grown folk, and you still got to make food exciting. And I think yeah. the problem with healthy eating right now is that it's uh. It's either very uh, suburbanized in, 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 in a clean sense where it's like it, it's extremely non-threatening and, and mm -hmm. very polished or it's, um, it's bland it, and tasteless. Bland, tasteless. Not like or the it feels like a vegan baby in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a lecture, you know, and you got to make food fun. And with Kogi and local, we just try to make food fun and not not bore people with the process, you know. Now, you were born in Seoul, South Korea. Yeah. Um, you're... Is it your mother is from South Korea, North Korea? My mom's from North Korea, but it was all one Korea. Yeah, you at know, that it time. was all one Korea, and then the war broke out, mm -hmm. and they picked up shit and just ran mm. across. And um, mm. but yeah, they're from uh, North Korea, and my dad's from the southern western tip, I guess, like where California would be in America. Right. Her family is um, a very interesting family, um, which is my grandparents, but. My my grandfather was a hustler, mm -hmm. oh. so so they they came down during the war from North Korea, and they didn't have nothing. But he was he was a hustler like a gangster, um, mm -hmm. and so he they planted themselves in an area in the middle of Seoul, mm -hmm. which would be kind of it, it's called Myeongdong, but it would be kind of like the fashion district of New York, mm -hmm. Manhattan, and um, and he started 
kind of gambling and then working with the other other street hustlers and gangsters and he started taking over the park and then his, um, his wife, my grandmother, started designing dresses and they built a little shop and then he started buying the real estate and he kind of created this whole area. Um, North Korea is used as a political football in, yeah. on the global scale when people talk about politics. Um, did you see that film that the guy did when Dennis Rodman went to North Korea? I saw clips of it. I didn't see the whole thing. He, pr- he painted a pretty bleak picture. Mm. Is that as bad as those reports? I've never been, um, but see, for me, I look at North Korea in a different way because mm-hmm. it's just 60 years or 70 years or so, one generation where these people are our cousins and our uncles. Yeah, that's why I'm asking because I, I, yeah. I imagine that that makes for some very interesting family dinners. Yeah, and so <laughs> the thing is, it, it, it just comes down to like, like family ribbing, you know, like mm-hmm. the way I've always looked at North Korea is, is just, it's more of like, it wasn't like this, this political difference. It mm-hmm. was more like all oh, those people from the North, they don't put enough salt in their food. Right. You know, or th- those people from the North, man, their food is so bland right. or like she, she talked like a country person, you know, and stuff, like food that. Always yeah, better. Stuff, stuff like that <laughs> versus it being like th- they're evil communist people that are going to bomb the world, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, and so, yeah, it's been different. It's the same way for me as we were talking about earlier with street food. A lot of people, when Kogi came out, you know, I've always represented the streets. And a lot of people were coming at street food like it was dirty. Um, it was made from immigrants. Uh, they were calling it roach coaches. You know? Roach coach, yeah. And so that's a political stance. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's like, let me show you the beauty of street food. Let me show you what we're really about. Mm-hmm. And um, these are this is the food that I grew up on. These right. are the these are the aunties and the tias and the and the uncles that I that that when I was walking around L.A. that I that that were kind to me, you know. And right so, now you said tias and and, and you do like Korean and Mexican seems to go together very well. Yeah, I read some the spices. I heard, I heard some stupid like Illuminati fact or whatever like. <laughs> Long time ago, when the 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 world was together, the Pangea, yeah, Pangea, that Mexico and Korea were touching. Mm. This is so I stupid mean, shit that I heard a long see time that, ago. <laughs> so when it separated, like that's why somewhere deep we are all the soul, Asiatic, Black, yeah. African, Latino. I like uh, Korea. <laughs> yeah. I lived in Koreatown when I first moved here. Uh-huh. So uh, I want to talk to you about Anthony Bourdain. Uh, yeah. He was a model for a lot of people on like food TV. And he was just like a white dude that got it, right? Yeah. So like what what do you miss about Anthony Bourdain in the food conversation? Oh man. We both knew him, right? Yeah. yeah I I, I did his show the last yeah. um No Reservations he did in Brooklyn. Yeah. And I got to know him. The only time yeah. we hung out was that day. Yeah. But I read Kitchen Confidential, which yeah. that changed my life when it came to food and changed yeah. it came to looking at chefs. I didn't realize how much went into being a chef until I read Kitchen Confidential. Mm. Yeah. But when I read it, I realized that we were working at uh the supper club in New York at the same time. Okay. So I was probably eating his food. Oh shit. um it was a fantastic experience with him on so the show. So you were performing and he was cooking? I was I was uh handing out flyers for the okay. party promoters who were pro- Funk Master Flex was d- was a uh, yeah, DJ yeah, yeah. at that club. Nice. He was he was DJ. I mean he was cooking. Oh, yeah. Um but then you know what I what it was great was after I did his show, mm-hmm. we stayed in touch. Yeah. So I could hit him. I would be in in Italy, like in Rome. I'd be like, mm-hmm. "Where can I go to eat?" Because he answers his, emails real quick. Yeah, right? yeah. Beto and Mary. Yeah. Check that. I went there, and I'm I don't eat beef or pork, and that's mm-hmm. that's all they serve there. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Which I know was his. Well, that was his shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah, I want to hear about you know what she was asking you about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, my relationship with Tony. Anthony Bourdain was it, it was kind of like a relationship I had with the homies on the street, right? Mm-hmm. So I already knew he's extremely well read, witty, um, v- verbally proficient human being. You know, like the way he looked at the world, and um, I wasn't interested in getting into philosophical arguments or discussions with him, like. I had a relationship because most people that have relationship with Tony, they they love the tennis match or going back and forth and being witty and talking and and and, and finishing each other's sentences or go, going at each other. Uh, for me, I could spend hours with him, not say a word. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, again, those those are the relationships for me that mean the most is when you can sit on a couch with someone and just not even say a word. 
you know, and just look over and the only thing you say, you hungry? And then you get up and you go eat. And that's kind of the relationship I had with Tony is uh, he, pu- he he published my book. Um, mm. L.A. Sun. We, L.A. Sun. We had a, a great relationship all throughout. The first time I met him was I did a show, The Layover. And um, but from the moment we met, we we just it, it was like I met an old friend and um, we just kind of I don't know. We had like a silent relationship. It was weird. Like one of those friends you'd go over and then take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> take a nap. Like yeah, just take a nap. And then, you know, um, one of those relationships where you never have to explain yourself to each other. You know, we like the same foods. We like the same things. Um, uh, and we'd all, we'd be very honest with each other about stuff right out of the gate. Like uh, in 2012, I made um, an adjustment to my eating habits because – um, what happened was that was the anniversary of the LA riots. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people were, there was, a, I just had this, this weird reaction to the internet where everyone was saying the city is doing so well right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, and for me, I was seeing so many hungry people on the street, mm-hmm. a lot of kids with no opportunities. And I was like, what do you fucking mean? The city's doing good right now. Right. And they um, didn't see your perspective. Yeah. And yeah. so I decided to change my diet and eat more vegetables um, because I, cause I, I felt like I was doing everything I possibly could with the freedom that I had to try to redirect what was happening out here. Right. And I was hitting brick walls every time. So I was like, you know what, maybe if I change my diet, it'll just, at least for one second of the day, it'll allow me to think of maybe something I would have never thought about. And then, um, and it became this huge viral thing. It was like weird. Like when I decided to say that I was going to eat more vegetables and fruits, like people freaked the fuck out. They're like, what are you, vegan now? Are you vegetarian? You're not eating meat anymore? What's going on? And then Tony wrote me and he's like, listen, you know, I totally respect your point of view, but you got to understand that there are cultures around the world where meat is a privilege mm-hmm. and, it's, and yeah. it's a cultural right, a passage. And I just want you to consider that. And um, he definitely you know, liked and he meat just throw me stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, me stuff like he was that. like a meat like, advocate. Yeah. Speaking to LA riots, mm-hmm. growing up in New York, there's a, a slight, slightly contentious commu- uh, community relationship with Asian people in black communities, yeah. particularly Koreans. Uh, I remember watching Do the Right Thing. Yeah. Do the Right Thing comes out in 1989. Yeah. And you have the the, the, the f- famous scene where everyone's talking shit about each other race. Yeah. And um, the Korean guy is talking about the Jewish guy. Yeah. He's like, you egg cream drinking and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the, the situation happens with Bugging Out where there's a riot in the streets because uh, Sal, the cop choke, bug, choke bugging out. out, yep. And they go to the Korean store and they're like, you next, mm-hmm. right? But then one of the characters like, nah, he's one of us. Yeah. And the Korean guy in that scene is going, I'm black, yeah. I'm black. Yeah. <laughs> now, that was, that was impactful for me. That was like Spike Lee dealing with intersectionality early. Yeah. Right? Now, growing up in L.A., it was a lot more contentious. Yeah. We had our issues in New York. Yeah. But L.A., it, the issues, the, the Korean black issues became national news. You had Latasha Harlins get shot. Yeah. Ice Cube makes black Korea. Yeah. This all around the time of the L.A. riots. Yeah. You're growing up in this. Yep. You're coming of age in this, right? Mm-hmm. You're And you're not just growing up in it as someone who's Korean, but you're growing up in it as someone who's fully invested in the hip-hop community. Yeah. As you said, you became a member of that com- of those yeah. those communities. Um, how was it for you navigating through that? So for me, um, again, like we just, you just said, like I always looked at the world as being a part of a crew mm-hmm. or being a part of a friendship. And so... It's not that I ever saw myself as black or not Korean or mm-hmm. as Korean and not and or as Mexican. I just saw as my of myself as from Los Angeles. Mm. Right. You know, and so during that time it was a very difficult time because I, I want to put on record though that a lot of that stuff, although it was real, the Latasha Harlan situation, mm-hmm. um, which was not a good situation. No, it was not. For anybody and, and for you know, anybody. A menace you know? to society. Yeah. Did sort of like a fictionalized yeah. of where that, how something like that could even start. But beyond those certain specific moments, I would say 80% of the relationship between the Korean merchants and the black community in Los Angeles was a good relationship. Mm-hmm. There's always, there was always a Mr. Park in the neighborhood or yeah. a Mrs. Kim, 
you know, mm-hmm. or or a Mrs. Lee in the neighborhood. You go to Grape Street, there's a Miss Lee that ran the liquor store right in front of the projects for mm-hmm. 20 years. Uh, everyone who's from 55 years old down to about 24 years old right now all grew up with Miss Lee. But that is part of the contention because yeah. people look at it like, well, how come Miss Lee could come to this neighborhood yeah. and have a 20-year-old a, a driving mm-hmm. business? Yeah. Where where everybody else who looks like me is destitute, mm-hmm. and I totally um, I totally understand that perspective too, and that's why when the riots happened, it was really tough for me personally because mm-hmm. I was I was torn between these two kind of like cultures of my life, mm-hmm. you know. Um, one was not more important than the other. Mm-hmm. Me being Korean was not more important than me being from Los Angeles, mm-hmm. and it was tough, man. I because uh, I I. It was tough because I knew friends that were looting Mm -hmm. and that were mad Mm -hmm. and I was hanging out with them and they, and I was, I was there with them. And then I was also in Koreatown protecting Koreatown. And then I also was to get by at that time. I was writing for a a local publication. Mm -hmm. They used to pay 50 bucks an article and that was Mm -hmm. the best money I could make at that time. (laughs) So they had me go out and cover a couple stories in liquor stores that were being protested. And, um, and it was, it was tough because I had to, like I, I don't know. It was weird. Like when I when I went to these liquor stores in South Central, on one end when I was parking and walking through, nobody gave me shit because I don't know if it was the way mm-hmm. you know the aura that I mm-hmm. give or just you know where I come from. Like people, just you like, probably you know, carried yourself in a certain carry, way. Yeah, what up? What up? What up? You know, I hear you, and I, I would talk to them, listen to their side, and I go in the liquor store, and there's this old Korean man that was just so fucking stubborn, mm-hmm. and um. And they were they were boycotting the store, but he's like, I'm not going to leave here. You got to burn this shit down before you take me out. And um, I understood where he come from, but I didn't agree with him, mm. you know. And so it was a very complex moment in my life where I had to confront these things of I don't I I understand this elder from my community, and I understand probably what his children go through, and mm-hmm. I know he wasn't here originally to exploit anything he came to the right. country he's, he's with nothing he's an immigrant he's making a buck yeah this is like this is what america is supposed really to yeah. represent that starts up all it of this drama all of between yeah. everybody and it's like if we all just start thinking for ourselves yep. then it's like you don't you don't get bred to hate somebody you don't come out when you yeah. just go and you're in a community it's very easy for blacks mexicans and koreans to all yeah. just join together because we have similar cultures it's not just easy it. it's necessary, necessary oh yeah for us to, to roll together because power in numbers is not just a cliche phrase yeah. like we're fighting a system that works against all of us and we talk oh, yeah. about this on our show a lot about you know there is it, america is still the world is still a caste system right so the closer you get to white the the more privilege you have you know, people who have, uh, you know, uh, Asian people, Hispanic people, there there are there are uh, Hispanic people, uh, Latino people who are very dark skinned, mm-hmm. who are just straight black. But I'm talking about the ones with lighter skin. Yeah. You know, they get uh, privilege over even even in black communities. Light skinned black people get treated different. Oh, yeah. Even in and, and that racism is so pervasive. I imagine that even in Korean culture, mm-hmm. dark skinned Koreans are shitted on. It's all yeah. culture. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. That's how people that's try to bleach supremacy. their skin. It's it's that's it, the, that's and it's pr- crazy that yeah. we allow them to be that big when it's so. If we put all of us together, we're we're gonna outnumber them. So mm-hmm. it's like crazy that they they let the hate that is taught to just like get that big. The weird thing about what you guys are mentioning with with skin tone is in Korean culture, it it doesn't even have to, anything to do with directly with white supremacy mm-hmm. or anything like that. But what's weird is just somehow it made its way into Korean culture because as well. Because it does have to do with it. it. Because it does it's, have to do it's with that it. It's that insidious. Because I'm dark. It's not on the surface. Yeah, it's not on the surface. It's so insidious. It, it's yeah. insidious. And so I'm dark. And so what you get as a Korean when you're dark like this is you get like, uh, oh, he must be a country person. Yeah. Or they found him under a bridge. Or uh, he must be on the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're light skinned, then you come from the upper class. Mm-hmm. Or... Um, you know, you live in in a night in a nice neighborhood, or you, he must run a company. So even in countries where white people are vastly the minority, white supremacy still all yeah, the yeah. They day. they were very smart in what yeah. they in 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 the big ass corporation that they built that is white supremacy. They were very meticulous and calculated. Now let me ask you this: mm-hmm. so white supremacists always use not just Koreans but all Asians. Mm-hmm. Uh, as sort of a 
you know, it, it's like there's this model minority myth, right? The mm-hmm. myth of the model minority. Yeah. You know, white supremacists, they like eugenics. Mm-hmm. They like IQ testing, even though yeah. in scientific cir- uh, circles has been debunked. Yeah. But they'll say, you know, black people have 85 IQs. Black people don't have low IQ. Black people, people of color, people from Africa have low IQs. And that's because IQ mm-hmm. testing is culturally, culturally biased. And it's based on, you know, your proximity to European mm-hmm. customs culture. and culture. Yeah. You'll call them out on it. You say you're being racist. And they'll be like, no, I'm not. I'm not racist because Asian people have the highest IQs. And then they say, well, I'm attracted to Asian women. And so they, they use Asian people as a way, and they weaponize Asian people mm-hmm. against black people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you see that happening? For sure. Mm-hmm. They've created two polar opposites. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the scheme is, and, um, and I don't agree with that either because it, Asian people aren't born smarter, you know? Mm-hmm. Maybe if there is some truth to some sort of success within the Asian community, it just comes from hard work. It comes from hard work and it yeah, comes from... It doesn't come from the fact that they were born smarter than yeah, someone else. Yeah, it comes know? from, just from what I can tell, yeah. and there's probably a sociologist or someone who knows better than me, mm-hmm. but it comes from people who have the privilege to, yeah. to send their kids to America yeah. are the people who are the elites, and yeah. they send their oh, kids yeah. to America with the with this purpose yeah. of getting into these schools and yeah. getting and educating yourself and doing well yeah. same they do the same thing to Nigerians yeah, yeah. The, the Nigerians are looked at as as the educated as group as the educated group because Africa, it's yeah. the wealthy yeah. mm-hmm. the people who made money off that oil money you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying people who made money off of white supremacy they could be black as dark as night but they still made money off yeah. of taking exploiting black people and they send their kids here. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm I'm generalizing a little bit. I try not to generalize. I, I'm at all. going yeah. with the generalization. You know? <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> but um, but I I'm I'm only I'm only speaking on how people generalize them. Yeah. You know, it's and obviously that doesn't mean that Nigerians are smarter or anyone yeah. from any any Asian country is smarter. But the thing about Asian people that a lot of people recognize is like a lot of the a lot of the past success is, is making up for some shit that we don't got. Like mm-hmm. we ain't that big, man. You mm-hmm. know, we gotta like, you know, like we're kind of smaller folk. You know, like <laughs> we got we gotta compensate <laughs> for some other shit. We gotta syndrome. work harder. Right. You know, like we ain't that athletic, man. And like we, you know, like fucking, <laughs> y'all can dance now, though. We, get, we can dance now, but yo, like, Koreans with the break dance with the b boy yeah. shit. Yo, um, we not fucking with y'all on the b boy shit. I know. Have you ever seen that shit? Just doesn't come naturally. The shit they're they're, they're work. working like twenty four hours. Have you ever a day. seen the b boy scene in Korea? It's crazy. They forget about. It. I love watching the it, Korean because they do the fighting and stuff, and that's like dancing. Yeah. But we're talking a lot of woke shit right now and that's uh-huh. like what you want to do with the for the broken bread but the um show that you have on netflix the chef has gotten so much more love than that how yeah. did that make you feel were you a little bit frustrated or oh no not at all but it, it the chef show is something i had never experienced um did it come out of the movie came out of the movie with john right. favreau john yep. favreau is one of my favorite creatives yeah working john's uh, amazing that's a great a great guy his his his, his career path his acting path his, his, his mm-hmm. writing his directing everything and so what i reading about you i didn't I re- understand that he really dove into the chef world when he made that yeah movie. so if you get to know john what you'll get to know is that he doesn't half step on anything mm-hmm. so uh whether it, it's when he you know through iron man and really mm-hmm. getting into the storyline and and under and being a, a fan and nerd himself on on the comic world mm-hmm. and and um the VR or the the animation and the technology mm-hmm. and the VR and all the yeah it's, and, it's amazing what he's done film wise yeah and so yeah. with cooking it um, originally my job when we met was just kind of like to be like a consulting coach in a sense like if he was going to do a boxing movie I was going to show him a few moves right mm-hmm. um, I was just going to show him but we connected right away and um, and he really cared about this stuff and he he applied himself and um, He's he's very 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 uh, I don't even know what the word good at great at his the dexterity in his hands mm. like he he would go from chopping not knowing a chop to being proficient it was like like a like fast forwarding a movie he would go in the time in about a minute I would see it transform in front of my eyes mm. and so he picked up on everything extremely quickly and then and then because he got better at some stuff it sparked his curiosity Mm -hmm. and it never ended so then the movie ended Mm -hmm. and um we were like 
two kids at summer camp Aww. that like spent every single day together every single <laughs> Can we minute just become best friends yeah we became best friends everything pen pals all that and then it ended and we didn't know what to do Aww. you know and so for the next year we started thinking of things of like how do we get back to that thing again how do we get back to that moment where we can spend as much time together as we can you know can and be with each other so uh it ended up being this show uh, the chef show. So, to your question, I'm not disappointed in the ratings or the or the viewership between Broken Bread or um, the chef show. The chef show has has been an incredible moment in my life. You know, um, I've been an independent kind of artist, underground, self funded mm -hmm. for the last 11 years, and I'm a I'm a I'm a local. I'm recognized locally, but you know, not pretty much not beyond that. You know, and but the chef show over the last five months that it's been out has, I mean, I've gone from maybe, you know, thousands of people knowing me to millions, tens of millions of people knowing me now. And that's a big jump. It's a beautiful yeah, thing. Yeah, it is. I yeah. was watching it. Um, you talked about smoking weed and, you know, smoking weed is something I enjoy as well. I okay. do not still smoke? smoke any of the I do smoke. Okay, yes. great. Um, but you've also spoken in the past about addictions. Yeah. And you've had some serious addictions. Serious ones. Uh, yeah. Crack cocaine. Yeah, and well, crack wasn't really in a, 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 a huge, it was an addiction for one week. Oh, okay. What? what? But what? I, go, I, go, I go in and then I get out. Okay. <laughs> but and, gambling, and gambling, was, too. gambling was a long one. Oh, you mean yeah. a week at a time, not no, no, just one week, one week one total. Week. No, it was one week in New York. That's it. So just he had a quickly crack on the track, on a the crack one was, you're going to appreciate this. This was 1991, New York. Mm -hmm. 1991. I met a girl. I I, I so went out. I took I, I hitchhiked and took the bus and mm -hmm. took the train out to New York. And uh, or actually to um, Providence, Rhode Island, and, and she was at school there. Um, showed up her at her door, uh, didn't announce anything. Shit was creepy. I know. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> it's sorry. It's romantic. The, the, if y'all were together, it's romantic, it's romantic in the context together. of a romance comedy. Yeah, uh, and then, romantic yeah. comedy. You can do creepy shit like that. Knock, knock, knock. Open the yeah. door and just fucking. I saw Wedding the, Crashers the, the other day. He, yeah. Owen Wilson's character was creepy as fuck. Yeah. <laughs> They're always creepy. But keep going. Movies. So that, I was Owen Wilson. I, I <laughs> face dropped. Wait, was she Did, having sex with someone? No, no, but it didn't oh. work out, and I was devastated because I was in love, and um, oh. and it just set me off. I was young. It set me off on a spiral. So I went down to New York and I checked into. I didn't have any money on me really. You don't need. I, money I had for like three hundred. I had like three hundred bucks on me, but but check this out. Like I. <laughs> I checked into the YMCA in Times mm -hmm. Square. It was seven bucks a night. You get a little room. And mm -hmm. this was during, this was pre Giuliani. Right. So it was a lot of shit going on everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I got arrested for a lot of that stuff. Back yeah. then. Doing crack too? No, not doing crack. <laughs> oh. like a lot of Giuliani quality of life type things. Oh, <laughs> keep going. Gosh. And then I got, I was outside just hanging out smoking. And then um, I got, I got swindled by a hustler for like my last 300 bucks. It was a weird thing. And then, um, I was a classic very, New York story. Yeah. Classic New York story. Yeah. I was, I was vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Motherfucker sniffed that out from three mm -hmm. blocks away. Oh. I was, I was in LA. Hearted. They call that a mark. Yeah. I was a mark in that moment. I'm, I've never really been a mark, <laughs> right. but in that moment I was right. a mark. You were out of your element. <laughs> yeah, I was out of my element. Yeah. I understand what it means yeah. to be a mark. You know? Oh man, Mark. <laughs> and then this other dude came and said, man, that motherfucker got you. And, um, and he's like, come up to my room, man. I'm, I got some shit to get your mind off it. And he had a crack pipe. And mm. then we smoked it and we were out. And then for the next seven days, I hung out with this dude. <laughs> um, and we and he and he taught me a little bit about New York, like in that moment. Mm -hmm. Like we were pretty much on the west side right there on whatever it is, Ninth Avenue mm -hmm. and all that where all the drugs were being, all the yeah. drugs were. And he's like, never give up your fucking lane and when you walk in the street. So we would walk and just, and never give up your shoulder. So then you're the bitch. That's where, hey, I'm walking here. Yeah, I'm, and, and just like, you know, and we would just bust through people. Yeah, man, baby. Just like, just keep going, dude. And like, you never give up your wow. shoulder. And, um, and then we would just like score shit. And so I like went down. This sounds spiral. like, what's that movie? With with Robert Redford and Midnight Cowboy. Yeah, it was like Midnight I don't Dash know, but it should be like a movie for it sure. Like that. I watch Hoffman. it. Ratso. Yeah, you met like Ratso. That. Yeah, Ratso. I met Ratso, <laughs> and I went down the spiral. I would and watch then this. I woke up, and then I and there was this like just like like Midnight Cowboy. There's this like smudged mirror, and I saw myself. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? What, wow. What am, I, what am I doing? And then got up. Um, I had a, a relative in New Jersey. Uh, called her up. They picked me up at Penn Station, and I just kind of like, um. 
Uh, they gave me money to go back home, and then we paid them back, and that was it. But that was a week of crack. Now wow, you said that's that you, awesome. That, that is an awesome. Story. <laughs> oh, um, that was my week of crack. Yeah. <laughs> but you said you said in an interview once that you don't feel like you will ever completely give up your addictions. Now you just you said that was yeah. only one week, but you are talking more about the gambling. Well, gambling was a was a much longer uh, addiction. It, it actually destroyed my life, oh, you know? wow. and that actually led me to cooking, and then cooking saved my life. So. Um, uh, I started gambling very simply like most people do. You know, uh, you're young, you win a few hands, you feel like you're on top of the world. Um, you know, when you're when you're 19, 20 years old, 21 years old, like uh, $350, $500 mm -hmm. feels like fucking mm -hmm. a million bucks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, and then you just keep winning. And then then I started winning really big. I started winning like 10000 a night, mm -hmm. maybe sometimes uh, 25000 um, then I had a, a shoeboxes filled with hundreds of thousands of dollars. Damn. And then I started playing some really, really uh, high level games. Mm. And it's it's going back to movies like the movie Hustler. You know, I'm yeah. like Paul Newman. I'm fucking, yeah. I think I can do all this. Right. But you and, and then out of your element. I'm out of my element. <laughs> They're just waiting for me to right. get tired. Crash. Sharks. You know? Yeah. Right. And, um, and I was playing with some real heavy sharks, Hong Kong gangsters. Um, old school, old school, like, uh, poker players with the, with the jumpsuits on, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and I just started losing everything. And, but my confidence was so strong. I'm like, I, and my cockiness, I get it back. Then you get, to, then you get to zero and then, then you start to go below sea level right. mm -hmm. and below sea levels where you start, um, it starts out very simply at first, uh, borrowing a hundred bucks here, 300 bucks there. Uh, having your roommate cover rent this month, mm -hmm. you know, just little things like that. Then it's then it gets deeper, digging into uh, families' um, um, purses and pockets, mm -hmm. and you know, and um, it's it's like that's, and you just start losing yourself, like Samuel, like Samuel Jackson character. And Jungle oh, Fever. In Jungle Fever, right? It's I like, smoked the TV, Mama. Yeah, what did like, you wear? Samuel Jackson, your... he, was like <laughs> no, he, was, yeah. he was on crack. He was. He was on crack. When he got that part. It's like I didn't that know there were so many functional crackheads out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just learned something new. What did you wear when you were gambling? What was your style? Uh, I, I probably, I've i been dressing like this. <laughs> forever, uh, I was, LA chic. I was wearing this. I was dressing like this. Sometimes I'd have an Adidas tracksuit on. Um, but pretty much like this. What know? advice do you have for people who are dealing with these addictions right now? So, um, I'm still an addict. But what what was lucky for me was I was able to turn these vice addictions mm -hmm. into, a, I guess, a positive addiction. So I'm addicted to feeding people, mm. you know, and that's the thing that drives me now. I'm still an addict. Like, um, I'm still out there chasing this thing of like, I right now my addiction is I can't understand why there's a world where people can't eat good food, mm -hmm. right? So... Why don't people have access to food? So I'm out there creating shows. I'm, I'm creating restaurants that are up against everything in the world that have no chance of succeeding like a local, but we still going for it, you know, instead of opening a restaurant that will pad my bank account, mm -hmm. putting all of my resources that I can in that moment into that, um, just still trying to feed, if, if it's a thousand people today, trying to feed another thousand tomorrow. So um, I just found I was very lucky to be able to channel that addiction into something that created um, results versus destroying my, myself and my relationships. Um, mm. I don't know. I, I don't think once you become an addict, I don't think you can, you can ever stop it. You know, I, I think it, it just comes down to can you be able to channel that and 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 redirect it into something else, especially mm. as you get older. Yeah. You know, like it doesn't have to always be the gambling, drugs, sex stuff typical things that um that define addiction you know like uh um also there's treatments out there too that mm -hmm. people can look at you know I, i've never experienced it myself but um what my kid and my family have have shown me and taught me that they're open to it you know and they and they 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 utilize um uh different intellectual points of view and mm -hmm. spiritual points of view um you know and to be able to redirect that but uh yeah th there are compulsive spirits and, and addictive spirits and i don't think you can ever shake it and i think a part of the destruction of it is if you is you trying to move away from that or or somehow deny it you have to mm -hmm. be able to kind of confront it you mm -hmm. know? might as well face it 
He's addicted mm -hmm. to love. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, Roy Choi. Yay! Thank you.